All right, so this sheet will get given to you on the test. I like caution that just because you get this doesn't mean you don't need to know this stuff. Like if you don't know these formulas and you have to go back and forth to just know the formulas, you're gonna run out of time. Like it's just gonna happen. But if you know these formulas and you just wanna like confirm that you're right or you wanna check something because you're second guessing yourself, that's fine. But if you have to solely rely upon this sheet to get you these things, I promise you, it's gonna, it's gonna hinder you more than it's gonna help you just because of the timing. So, uh, and obviously this is not all you need to know, right? So I'm gonna go through each of the conics and say in addition to this what you would need to know, but you will get given this sheet. I'm gonna do like a double-sided. The front will be this and the back will be graph paper so that you can graph the questions that don't require graph, but it's helpful to have that. And you can double use it as your like scrap sheet, that kind of stuff. But I would just say, don't get this false sense of security. That's what makes you nervous about giving this thing. This false sense of security that everything you need to know is on the sheet and you don't need to study the formulas because it's not accurate, okay? All right, so the first one is the parabolas, okay? And you're gonna, again, just like the ellipses and the other th and the hyperbolas, you'll see two different types of questions with hyperbolas, I mean with parabolas. The first being, here's an equation of a parabola. Find the vertex, the focus, and the directrix. And it will also say, here's information about a parabola. Give me the equation of it. So if it's an x squared with a positive 4p, then it opens upward. If it's a negative 4p, it opens downward. And obviously, that's important when we graph it and also important when it gives you the information and you're trying to find the equation. If it's a y squared with a positive 4p, then it points to the right and a negative 4p points to the left. The squared term is always on the side by itself. If you wanna match this formula, then you keep it on the left. So you might have to rearrange your equation. And the it can have nothing on the front. So like nothing can be over here. I would have to get rid of whatever's there by moving it to the other side. Like that's the very first thing. Whatever's on the front of the y or the x that's raised to the first power is your 4p. And again, the sign tells you which direction. But if there's a number there, we set it equal to 4p to find out what p is. P is the distance from the vertex to the focus, which is a coordinate point, x, y, and vertex to the directrix, which is a line, x equals or y equals has to be, so if the parabola is facing up and down, then my directrix is gonna be a horizontal line, which would be a y equals. If my parabola is facing right and left, then my directrix is gonna be a vertical line or an x equals. So if I was plotting a vertical parabola, for example, I would know my vertex. I would go up however distance P is, and that's my focus. I would go down however many places P is, and that's my, which would be a Y equals. That's my directrix. And if it's horizontal, it's the reverse. I would still find my vertex. The focus is P distance away inside. And it's a coordinate point. And the directrix is P distance away. And it's a line. So it's an X equals. questions on parabolas. So you'll see in the review, but there are times in which it's going to give you, let's say it'll give you the vertex and the focus, and that lets you determine which direction it's going, what P is, and then you plug it into your equation. It could give you the vertex and the directrix, same thing. That's going to tell you which direction it goes, what P is. It could give you vertex, 
I mean, I could, sorry, I could give you the focus and the directrix and would you have to find the point in the middle to get the vertex um, and then the P would be half that distance. And it could give you like the direction and a coordinate point X, Y, and we plugged it in. But there's a little bit of practice on all that stuff on the review. If they give you the ver, I mean, sorry, if they don't give you the vertex and they give you the focus and the directrix, then your vertex is half the distance between. So like if they said, I don't know value wise, but if they said, this is my directrix and this is my focus, I'd have to find the coordinate point halfway between them to get the vertex. And then P is half the distance from focus to directrix or just count from vertex to one of them, and that's your P. You're welcome. Is there a question like that on the review to help us? Yeah, I think there's, I think so. If not, I'll, get, I'll grab one for tomorrow. There's definitely ones that give you information. I just don't remember if that gives you the focus and the directrix. All right, good on parabolas. Okay, then came ellipse. And the ellipse is our oval. If it is an x squared, well, first of all, order does not matter here, right? What matters is which one has the bigger denominator. So a is the bigger denominator here. If it's under the X, then it is wider than, it's horizontal, so it's wider than it is tall. If it's under the Y, then it's vertical. So it's taller than it is wide. Again, order does not matter. What matters is which one has the larger denominator. Your A is the distance from the vertex. Well, let me go center to vertex. B is the center to the co-vertex. And C is center to focus. A and C are both on the major axis. B is on the minor axis, or the covert text would be on the minor axis. C squared equals A squared minus B squared, opposite sign of my standard form. Major axis is 2B. Nope, major axis is 2A, sorry. Minor axis is 2B. And my center, which is the same for all of them, is HK. Always change the sign of what follows the X, then change the sign of what follows the Y. Be careful because order could be switched here. And it has to equal one. Questions on ellipses. Okay, then the last one was the hyperbolas. So with the hyperbolas, the A is first. And it has to be positive. So when we're putting our equation in standard form, we always make the positive one first. If it's under the X squared, then this is horizontal which means my branches go to the right and left. If it's under the Y squared, then it's vertical, which means my branches point up and down. When you graph these, you have to have the asymptotes. 
so you can make that box. That's obviously what I'd recommend. Oh, I don't know why I wrote this one. It's literally right here. This is already here. C squared is equal to A squared plus B squared with hyperbolas. But all the stuff at the top is the same. A is still center to vertex. B is still center to focus. Nope, holy moly. C B is still center to co-vertex. And C is center to focus. If your equation is horizontal, then your asymptote is y equals k plus and minus b over a times x minus h. And if your equation ends up in a vertical um, hyperbola, then your asymptote is y equals k plus and minus a over b x minus h. This time we say transverse axis, which is your major, equals 2a, and conjugate, which is your minor, equals 2b, center, still at zero, I mean at hk. It's transverse is the same as major. The longer axis. So if it's a horizontal, then the, the transverse axis is from vertex to vertex and it's horizontal. If it's vertical, then the transverse axis is from vertex to vertex and it's vertical. A line. If there, no, that's asymptotes. If there was a line connecting vertex to vertex, the length of it would be 2a, and that's your, that they call that the transverse axis. Okay. So, like if I have my hyperbola, this one's horizontal, the distance from here to here would be your transverse axis, and it would be 2a. But it's not going to get given to you on a graph. It's going to get given to you as information to be able to find the equation of the hyperbola. So we did a couple that said, like, when it was the ellipse, here's my vertices and my minor axis is 12. And then you would say 2b equals 12 and b equals 6. Or on the hyperbola, it would say, here's my co-vertices, whatever, and then here's my transverse axis length is 16. So 2a would equal 16 and a would be 8. So you're using it when they give you the information for the equation. You'll see it, it's on the review, but you'll see it there. What does the conjugate It's the minor axis, so it's this distance. It doesn't, you don't see it on the graph. That's what I'm saying, don't say looks like, because it's not on the graph. It's just telling you how far apart they are. 2a would be the whole length from one vertex to the other vertex. So it gives you a. 2a is the transverse, so it gives you a, if you solve for a. And then 2b is the conjugate, and that gives you b. But you don't graph it. You don't take it from your graph. It's only if they give you the information for the equation. Yep. Lauren. Um, do you start drawing the curve at the foci or the vertices? You start drawing the curve at the vertices. The foci, fall, the focus falls inside the curve, just like with a parabola. Always inside the scoop. Questions on hyperbola. All right, questions from the homework for me before we move into the review. And if you're good on the homework, then feel free to start review. My advice is start with the equation ones because we haven't done those for a couple of days, right? We did some of the graphing last week, but it's been a little bit of time since we did this stuff on the bottom here. It's here. It's like on the top here, on the bottom here. And then at the bottom, again, for the hyperbola. So it's kind of separated out. Just be prepared that these things are going to get shuffled together on your test. Yeah. So on the test, it's not going to say, like, find the equation of the hyperbola. No, it will say that. But it's not going to go in order like parabolas, ellipses, hyperbolas. It will get shuffled together. Okay. So yeah, yeah. The only time it's not going to say specific is when you're completing the square. Mm -hmm. Yep. 
Everybody's good on web assigned homework? Yeah. Okay. All right, this is six from the homework, okay? And it says hyperbola, but it doesn't necessarily gonna have to say that on your test. So just make sure when you get, you know, like first, you could look at it if they're all on the same side, then I can identify what it is by how many t pairs, I mean, how many variables are squared and the signs of them. So these have two variables squared, which means it's not a parabola, and they have opposite signs, which means it's a hyperbola. So it did say it in the instructions, but it might not on your test. And you still need to know how to do it. All right, so we're going to group together the y squared and the y. We're going to group together the x squared and the x. And we're going to bump the 32 to the other side, which would make it a negative 32. Before I can go any further with the first one, I have to take the 16 out. So 16 comes off the y squared and also the 64. I have to take the negative off the x squared, so the negative comes off the x squared and also the 8x, so it changes both those signs. Now I take the 4, I divide it by 2, that's 2 squared, it's 4, so I add the 4 in here. And I would normally add it to the 32, but I have to multiply by 16 first, which means I'm adding 64. Then I'm going to repeat that process with the x. x, take the middle term, which is 8. 8 divided by 2 is 4. 4 squared is 16. I'm adding 16 there, and normally I'd be adding 16 at the end, but I have to multiply by a negative, which means I'm subtracting 16. So I'd get 64 minus 48 here which is 16. Then I have 16 on the front, square root the first term, square root the last term, take the sign from the middle, put it in parentheses and square it. Repeat the process for the next one, minus square root the first term, square root the last term, take the sign from the middle, put it in parentheses and square it. And then it's a hyperbola. Either the hyperbola or the ellipse has to be equal to 1, so I divide everything by 16. And I get y minus 2 squared over 1 minus x plus 4 squared over 16 equals 1. And there is going to be a time on your test in which you're done. Like it just says find the equation of the whatever it is of the conic and you're done, and then there's gonna be a time on your test in which you, from here, have to find all the information. So if I carry that through, I know it's a hyperbola. I know my center is the opposite of what follows x, so be careful because x is set in here, second here, so negative four and positive two. Yep. How do you know if it's like something's a parabola? From the beginning, you're looking at the variables. There are two squared, which rules out parabola. Parabola would only have one squared and they're opposite signs. Same sign ellipse, opposite sign hyperbola. What did you say about um, the opposite sign? Opposite sign would be hyperbola, same sign would be ellipse. You're welcome. Then from there I would say, because the y is first, this is vertical, my a squared is first, so it's a is one, the b squared is second, so the b is 4. c squared equals a squared plus b squared. So c squared equals 17, and c equals the square root of 17. And also because it's vertical, my asymptotes are a over b. So my asymptote is y equals the k, which is 2, plus and minus. The a is 1. The b is 4, x minus a negative 4, which is the h, so it becomes x plus 4. Then I would bring in my graph. So the ones that you have to graph, you'll be provided a graph. And the other ones, I'm just going to give you a sheet of graph paper so that you can use it if you want to, because there's going to be obviously times when we're doing our equations where it's way easier to graph it to get the information. Yep. The dashed lines that make the X. So, are those, okay. 
Those dashed lines that make the X, that make us the box, that come from the box, those are asymptotes. Mm -hmm. All right, so center is negative 4, 2. It's vertical, so I go up and down the A. So up 1 and down A means my vertices are negative 4, 3, and negative 4, 1. I go right and left the B, which is 4, and those are my co-vertices, which are negative 8, 2, and 0, 2. I draw the box. I find my corners. I draw the asymptotes. And it's vertical, so my branches go up and down off my vertices. And then the foci, I add and subtract the C vertically, so from the Y. So the, so the foci are negative 4, 2 plus and minus square root 17. And you won't have to graph those foci, like you'll just give them, it will ask for it exact, so you want to keep it exact. If you wanted to approximate it to make sure your graph is right, root 17 is just a little bit bigger than 16, which would be like a 4.1. 1, 2, 3, 4.1. 1, 2, 3, 4. 1, 2, 3, 4. 1. Those would be your foci. Yep. Okay, so again, the homework told you it's an ellipse, but you should be able to identify that it's an ellipse by the x squared and the y squared both being there and both being the same sign. So I'm going to group together the x squared and the x, so 9x squared minus 36x. And then I'm going to group together the y squared and the negative 50, so plus 25y squared minus 50y. And then I'm going to bump the 52 to the other side, so equals negative 52. Now I gotta take out the leading coefficient on both of these. So take out the nine here and I get x squared minus four x. Take out the 25 here and I get y squared minus two y. Still equals negative 52. Now we complete the square. So four divided by two is two, two squared is four. I add the four in here. I would normally add the four here, but I have to multiply by the nine first. So I'm adding 36. Then second one, I take the two, divide it by two, that's one squared. It's one, I add the one in here. I would normally add one over here, but I have to multiply by 25 first. So I'm adding 25. So I get negative 52, and then this is 61. 61 minus 52 is nine. On the left, I'm gonna factor. So nine's in the front, square root first, square root last, take the sign from the middle, put it in parentheses and square it. Plus 25 stays on the front, square root first, square root last, sign from middle, put it in parentheses and square it. And here's the standard, oh, not yet, sorry. I have to divide by nine. So I get x minus 2 squared. And if you want to put it over 1 to remind you that it's there, that's fine. And then this second one, and this is where this one's tricky because it doesn't simplify. But in order to get the b or the a, whichever one it's going to be there, this has to come down to the bottom. So dividing like by that 9 would be the same thing as multiplying by the reciprocal, which means this 25 actually goes to the denominator of the 9. We reverse it. If I did keep change flip there, then the 25 would go to the top. That's why that works. And this equals 1. So it's x minus 2 squared over 1 plus y minus 1 squared over 9 25 equals 1. So now the bigger number, 1 is bigger than 9 over 25, bigger numbers under the x, which makes this horizontal. The center is 2, 1. A squared is 1, making a 1. B squared is 9 over 25, which makes this 3 fifths. 
and then c squared equals a squared minus b squared. And I have to give that a like denominator. So 25 over 25 minus 9 over 25 is 16 over 25. And that's c squared, so c is 4 fifths. So then if I were to graph this, my center would be at 2, 1. It's horizontal, so I go right and left the A, and that's my vertices. 1, 1, and 3, 1. I go up and down the B, which is 3 fifths. So up and down the B. which means my y is changing. The x will remain 2. And the y, which was 1, I'm going to add 3 fifths to it to get one of the covertices, which means 1 and 3 fifths. And I'm going to subtract one, 3 fifths from one of them to get 2 fifths. And then I would draw it. And then the focus, I would add and subtract C from the X. So the X coordinate, which is 2, I'd add and subtract, what was that focus? 4 fifths. And then the Y is still 1. So it would be 2 plus 4 fifths, which is 2 and 4 fifths, 1. 2 minus 4 fifths, which is 1 and 1 fifth and 1. <coughs> I will tell you that like the regular version, like we haven't even started on a makeup, but the regular version, we tried to go pretty easy on numbers. They're not awful, but like we run out of numbers. So like if you're one of those people that wakes up on the morning and you're like, mm, maybe I'll take the makeup. I'm telling you right now, we're not going to work as hard to make the numbers as pretty. It will be the same level, but you're going to see stuff that's, a, that's not perfect squares. So, I mean, if it gets you out of bed on Wednesday, get you out of bed on Wednesday. Yeah. It's a three. I'm so yeah, it's okay. The center was two one. Yeah, yeah. So the vertices are three. You mean which like how to find? Yeah, because it goes to, like the B squared and then to the B. Oh, like how to find B from B squared? Yeah. So you exactly. square root both the top and the bottom separately. Okay. And they these are both perfect squares. I think there was one in the homework that ended up leaving the per, the root in it. I think I was on the C, but you would just keep it add and subtract that. You wouldn't have to combine like terms. Mm -hmm. So would that, that would be the B. That's the B, okay. correct. And then the same thing would happen with C, right? C squared was 16 over 25, so you square root both. And that's the four fifths. This is a drill.